Hi, it's Gene, retired in Mexico, and we ask one question on this channel, which is, do they write them and sing them like they used to? A lot of people, young and old, they think the old music is better, but I'm not so sure. And today, uh, we're, well, first of all, we're recording outdoors because I'm still waiting on a replacement webcam, so I'm out here for the ambient light, and I will be picking up some ambient noise, but... I think a good choice today is to uh, count down my 30 favorite albums of 2002. So we're not going to play any music today, but I'm going to start with albums 30 through 16. So this is my favorite albums, and I emphasize the word favorite. I don't claim these to be the best albums. These are, are the ones that speak to me. And before we get into this list, I just want to make a comment about 2002. I think it's a year that you can't really fully talk about without talking about the attack on the World Trade Center, September 11, 2001. Uh, a couple albums that were released very late in the year 2001 that were important albums were a couple tribute albums uh, featuring a who's who of artists that uh, tried to raise money for this. And you had... Um, the concert for New York City and America a tribute to heroes and a lot of the mood in the music of 2002 some of it uh, that we'll talk about had nothing to do with the attack on the Trade Center but there were other albums that seemed to reflect that mood and so I just wanted to call that out I, I remember 2002 it was um, you know for a while people had kind of halted recording or you know it wasn't as interruptive as uh, the COVID pandemic but it really kind of put a hiccup in the industry for a while and people kind of uh, grappled a little bit with how they wanted to respond to that and some people uh, their themes seemed to reflect uh, the dark mood or they tried to have hopeful albums or various responses to that so I just wanted to call out uh, what happened in late 2001 and how it still affected the mood of music in 2002. All right, so let me bring up my spreadsheet and we're going to start with number 30, number 30, uh, which is, let me make sure I got this right here, uh, okay, number 30. So this is an album that fell quite a bit on my list. I used to have this a lot higher. Uh, but in re-listening to it recently, I realized that it's not a perfect album. It's got some weak tracks on it. This is Johnny Cash, American 4, The Man Comes Around. Now, you know, he made a series of albums with Rick Rubin. You probably know the story already. And uh, I love those albums. This is uh, maybe one of the weaker ones in the series, but I still like it quite a bit. It has the song Hurt on it which is so I well the video is iconic um, something I might talk about here is the word iconic iconic is a visual term and it means it has to be visual so a band so Johnny Cash is iconic the video to hurt is iconic the song hurt is not iconic because you can't have something that's auditory be iconic so just a little bit of a thing there where the language is being misused a little bit. Uh, Hurt is what I would call an epic song. His cover of Nine Inch Nails. And then he does a cover of Depeche Mode, Personal Jesus. These are great songs. Then there's other songs on here that are a bit of a stretch. He does uh, Simon and Garfunkel's Bridge Over Troubled Water. And I think it's a little out of his element. And then he chose to have Fiona Apple duet with him on this. And I like Fiona Apple a lot. Uh, her albums may show up on my future lists. But I think she's the wrong choice for that particular song. So it's, it's kind of hit and miss. Uh, there's a duet with Nick Cave that's fantastic. Um, and I like the title track, The Man Comes Around, which is a gospel song about the reckoning of uh, the second coming of Jesus and all this kind of thing. It's just... A really interesting album, but some weak tracks, so I'm going to put this at number 30. Coming in at number 29 is another veteran who, this was his last original 
album, last album of uh, original material in the last 20 years. He has recorded nothing but either re-recordings of his old songs or covers of other people's songs. And that's Peter Gabriel, his album Up. It's a good album, not his best. Uh, some wonderful tracks on here. Uh, uh, I Grieve and Darkness and uh, his duet with Nusrat Fateh Ali Khan from Pakistan. But there's a couple tracks on here that are you know, not as strong, and there's songs like the Barry Williams Show, which are still kind of head scratchers. And so I, I love the sound of this album. It's beautifully played, beautifully produced, great stuff. Um, but I just, compared to his uh, albums in the 70s, 80s, and 90s, this does not quite compare with those, but I like Peter Gabriel's Up quite a bit. Coming in at number 28, is an artist you might be surprised that I like. I've seen her twice in concert, and I'm actually a really big Sheryl Crow fan. Um, I think she's underrated, actually. She's kind of hit that adult, con adult contemporary spot, but she does it better than anybody else. This is the album Come On, Come On, with songs like Soak Up the Sun, and there's a song on here called Safe and Sound, where her musical partner, Jeff Trott, does a number of layered guitars. It's really a wonderful song. Steve McQueen is uh, funny and fun. Uh, you know, but there's a couple average tracks on here, so I can't put it any higher on here. But I, I like Sheryl Crow a lot. This might be the last album of hers that I really, truly loved. Uh, but Come On, Come On, it was a big commercial success. Um, some people don't like Sheryl Crow, but I don't know. I, like I say, I think she's underrated. I, th I think it hits a sweet spot for me. So number 28, uh, Cheryl Crow. Coming in at number 27 uh, is an album that might be a little bit lightweight, but I just enjoy listening to it. The musicianship is so good. It's my favorite album by the jazz vocalist Diana Krall, and it's her album Live in Paris. So she does mostly standards on here, and then she closes with um, covers of Joni Mitchell and Billy Joel. Yeah, but she does a pretty good version of Just the Way You Are. And I don't know, it's just the band crackles, they're hot. It's a really good recording, and uh, I have the DVD that goes with this, and she's just... Um, uh, you know, she might not be as edgy as some other jazz artists, but in kind of that Nora Jones vein, she just she does she just does what she does better than anybody else, and I en I really enjoy. I just recently listened to the whole album from start to finish in one sitting, and and it was fun. I enjoyed it quite a bit. So Diana Krall. So we're starting off this list with some big names and some veterans, and we're going to continue that with number twenty six which is the essential Leonard Cohen, one of the best lyricists ever in the history of music. Uh, love Leonard Cohen. The only reason I don't have this higher is it is a double album and it's a little difficult to listen to all the way through from start to finish, even though the songs are great. You know, he's not the best singer in the world. A lot of people cover Leonard Cohen songs. Um, you think of a song like Hallelujah on here, which is such a wonderful song. But frankly, I prefer listening to John Cale or Jeff Buckley or Katie Lang or the other people that have covered that song famously. And I always prefer the uh, cover versions of some of his songs. Other times, like Famous Blue Raincoat, I prefer his version. But his lyrics are so... Uh, so wonderful and you gotta love Leonard Cohen so the double CD compilation the essential Leonard Cohen I would rather listen to this than any of his albums except for the last couple that he did late in life he did some albums that are wonderful to listen to all the way through I think Leonard Cohen actually got better as a performer and a singer throughout the years um, but anyway classic songs like um, Suzanne and Tower of Song and wow these are just um, first we take Manhattan 
And these are wonderful songs. If you're not familiar with Leonard Cohen, he was just uh, right up there with Bob Dylan and Chris Christopherson and some of the other great, great lyric writers of the, uh, of the last century. So love this. Coming in at number 25 from England is another album that, like the Johnny Cash, that used to be a lot higher on my list. And um, it's lost a little bit of its luster over the years. Um, I used to think this was one of the best singers of the 21st century. Now when I listen to it, sometimes I think he over-emotes a little bit. That's Chris Martin of Coldplay. And this is A Rush of Blood to the Head, which is still my favorite Coldplay album. And uh, so because it's my favorite Coldplay, it's, it's good enough to get on my list. I've got a mosquito running, uh, flying around my head here. Sorry about that. Um, death to mosquitoes. Muerte mosquitoes. Anyway, uh, <laughs> a rush of blood to the head. Um, famous now for songs like The Scientist. Really, really great songs. Uh, yeah, I still like this album quite a bit, but it has dropped down on my list. Um, but the, the, the players on this, the band, they're so perfect. Uh, they're great musicians. And yeah, the best Coldplay album. So I enjoy this, number 25. Coming in at number 24, we're back to a veteran. And we will have uh, some newer artists, especially uh, 15 through 1 when we do part 2 of this video. But at the bottom of my list are a lot of veterans. And coming in at number 24 is Elvis Costello, When I Was Cruel. This is an interesting album. Uh, it's a lot edgier than, than you would think. And songs like 45 are just wonderful. Uh, uh, there was a uh, Doll Revolution. This song was covered by the Bangles. Uh, a lot of really, really good songs on here. Not my favorite Elvis Costello album, but certainly a, a great 21st century effort from him. Uh, Costello's kind of hit and miss in the 21st century, but this one, this one's pretty darn, uh, pretty darn cool. Um, most people liked it. Um, yeah, it just it, it kind of got split reviews. All Music only gave it three stars, but Pitchfork surprisingly gave it eight stars, or uh, eight points rather, eight point zero, and so it divided people. Uh, but I think his voice is in terrific form, and I love um, Elvis Costello. And of course, he's married to Diana Krall, so it looks like I got Miss Krall and Mr. Costello both on this list here. Coming in at number 23, this is an album I shouldn't like because I'm not really a big fan of the Jay Giles Band. Uh, and let me tell you a quick story about Jay Giles Band. I saw them in uh, 82, I think it was. And it was a good show, it was their freeze frame tour, but unfortunately for them, there was this little known band that opened up for them, these 19 and 20 year olds. And that was the band U2 on their second album tour before they became famous. Uh, the um, second album, which was, what was the name of that second album? Had Gloria on it. Um, October. This was the October tour. And I saw U2 and I was like, wow, wow, okay, this is the future. I was totally baptized on the spot. And I had trouble enjoying the Jay Giles performance because of how great the opening band was. But the lead singer, Peter Wolf, has made some solo albums, and this one, Sleepless, that came out in 2002, I was reading up on it, and he had just pretty much given up. His last album it was a, a commercial failure, and so he just decided to do whatever he wanted just to do the kinds of songs that he liked. Uh, some of them were originals, some of them were covers. And by kind of not caring, he ended up making this great, great album. It was just true to his spirit. And there's a bunch of uh, famous people on here that duet with him on one song. There's a guy you might have heard of, Mick Jagger. And on another song, Keith Richards, that's a fun song. And Steve Earle's on here. And you know, he called in a lot of chits, and Sleepless is a 
tremendous uh, album, mostly based in roots music and uh, you know blues and rhythm and blues and the kind of music he liked. But man, he's in top form on here. The only thing he does is sing. He doesn't play any instruments. But this is a killer album. It did not sell well. It was not a commercial success. But it got good critical reviews. Uh, All Music, for example, gives it four and a half stars. And I agree. I think Sleepless is uh, is really a surprise album. Uh, Peter Wolf, someone I was never a big fan of, but man, he pulled an ace out of his sleeve on this one. Number 22, one of my all-time favorite artists, someone I saw a few times in concert. Big, big, big David Bowie fan. This is the album Heathen. Um, and this one kind of divided the critics, too. Um, I like this album sonically a lot. Uh, Tony Visconti came back to work with him after an absence of several years. And it's got some terrific songs on it, some interesting covers. He does a cover of um, the Pixies, their song Cactus. He does a cover of the legendary Stardust Cowboy. He does a cover of Neil Young. And then mixes those with some originals like uh, Slow Burn and uh, just, I don't know. This is a really good album, but it's not, it's not Bowie's best uh, I wouldn't put it in my top five David Bowie albums, but it's a strong, strong effort. It got a lot of attraction because he raised money for this album by selling Bowie bonds. <laughs> and it was a success, and he got enough money to record the album. And uh, yeah, it's got a lot of interesting electronic uh, little bleeps and bloops on it, and his voice is in great form. So Heathen is still a really strong, strong album. Coming in at number 21 is an anthology of someone you may not be familiar with. This is a band out of England called Cabaret Voltaire. And this compilation is called The Original Sound of Sheffield, 78 to 82. Sheffield being a town in uh, the UK. And these guys were instrumentally influential in early industrial electronic. By that I mean they took electronica and industrial music and they combined them and they influenced so many bands and this is the creme de la creme and it includes a number of singles that were not available on albums so when I want to listen to Ca Cabaret Voltaire I listen to this album the original sound of Sheffield um, I owned this album until very recently. I think it's down at the record store. I decided to sell it, but it doesn't mean that I don't love it. I'm just downsizing a little bit. And if you don't know Cabaret Voltaire, man, totally, totally important music and listenable, uh, but not easy listening. Uh, some of their songs like Nag, 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 they're definitely not... Uh, easy listening they're in that industrial camp but I love Cabaret Voltaire highly recommended anthology and they did do uh, three original Sound of Sheffield compilations this one which is the earliest material is the one that I like and hits the spot for me coming in at number 20 now we're on to some original music uh, the doves which if you watched one of my earlier countdowns, you know I like The Doves. This is the last broadcast. Really good album. Songs like Pounding are just so awesome. And this is a good point for me maybe to talk about another artist that received higher reviews from this year, which was uh, Interpol. And Interpol, is their album is generally considered a better album than The Doves. And I kind of put them in the same wheelhouse, uh, but for me, I'd rather listen to The Doves than Interpol. I don't have Interpol on this list. I do like that album quite a bit, but The Doves are, are what hits, really hits for me. And I just like the singing and the sonics and the production and the mood. Oh, sorry about that. My WhatsApp is going off. There we go. All right. Uh, something I... Yeah. Anyway, uh, <laughs> sorry. Anyway, the last broadcast by England's Doves. Uh, like this album quite a bit. Um, Pitchfork gave it an 8. 
they liked it. Coming in number 19 is a band that I've seen a few times live and they're very underrated from East Los Angeles, Los Lobos, which means the wolves. Their album, Good Morning, Aslan. Uh, I think this was produced by Mitchell Froome, I think, and it's got a lot of interesting sonic sounds that he likes to do. Uh, Los Lobos is just a great band that emerged in the 80s. They're one of the best live bands you'll ever see, and they can do anything. Their repertoire, their repertoire is, I don't know, I don't know if there's a band that does more styles than them. I mean, they had a song called Don't Worry Baby that sounds like a ZZ Top rave up, and then they turned around and worked on an album of Disney music. And then they did a cover of Marvin Gaye's What's Going On, which was very serviceable, very good uh, cover. And then they do uh, Mexican music. <laughs> I mean, and this was the band that did the soundtrack for La Bamba, the movie about Richie Valens. They're all over the map. And on here, we've got some good ballads and some good rockers, and they're in fine form. And some wicked, wicked electric guitar on here. So big fan of Los Lobos. They um, are, I think, are a truly underrated treasure, American treasure. Love this band, Los Lobos. Um, it's, it's, it's both, it's musically mostly traditional, uh, but sonically they throw in a bunch of things from the kitchen sink and just great stuff. Um, coming in at number 18 is one of my favorite artists and like the Diana Crawl. It's just an album that sounds good, and when I'm in the mood for some not-too-adventurous music that just really hits a sweet jazz or rhythm and blues spot, this is uh, Van Morrison, Down the Road. Probably the last album that he's recorded that I truly love. Uh, in 99, he did an album uh, back, what was it called? But anyway, he did an album in 99 and this one in 2002, and they're just great uh, late career albums by him. Down the Road has nothing particularly surprising on it. Uh, it's just well played, well sung, well written, just classic, classic Van Morrison. He was on top of his game here, and I think he might have lost his way just a bit um, until he got back into some jazz albums, but down the Road is a well-written, well-composed album, and, and I, I love it. Coming in at number 17, my first of three rap albums on here, Jurassic 5, Down the Road. And, uh, oh no, I'm sorry, that was the Van Morrison title. I'm misreading here. Power in Numbers. I think this is their second album. And they do group... Uh, they do group... Uh, there's five of them, I believe, and they do group vocals. So they're a uh, rap group, not a duo or a single artist. And so you get all these uh, exchanges of vocals, and they're fun. They do, um, you know, some heavy topics, but mostly they're having fun throughout this album. And it just, this also hits a sweet spot for me. I kind of like this uh, group rap this uh, five rap artists approach that they do. It's uh, fun, each one of them has their own characteristic style. And uh, one, one of the DJs in the band, Cut Chemist, went on to uh, be pretty successful with his own career. So Jurassic Five, a band that broke up, but they made two or three albums and uh, I love them. If you haven't had a chance to hear Power in Numbers, I highly recommend it. And then coming in at number 16 is an album that is somewhat about 911, and this is Bruce Springsteen's The Rising, an album he did mostly with E Street members, but also brought in some guest artists. And it's a pretty emotional album. You have songs like Into the Fire, which was a song about the uh, fire department uh, people that went up in the Twin Towers to try to rescue people and perished. Uh, there's a song called I'm Missing, yeah, An Empty Sky, I Woke Up to an Empty Sky, and You Were Gone, and What I Want is a Kiss and an Eye for an Eye. <laughs> I mean, pretty good stuff. He also did a song where he um, 
uh, decided to bring in some Muslim elements, and this was really risky for Bruce, and a lot of people hated that song, but I love it. It's called Worlds Apart, and uh, you know, he's stretching on that song, and I really love it. With that said, there are some safe numbers on here, some kind of by the number Bruce Springsteen songs. Um, so I can't claim this to be a perfect album. It also split the critics. Um, yeah, I got all sorts of different reviews. Uh, all Music gave it four stars, Pitchfork 8.2. So there were two people there that really liked it. Rate Your Music had it at number 82. So, you know, it mostly got good reviews, but not everybody loved this album. Uh, it's not directly about 911, and some of the songs were written prior to that. So, for example, My City of Ruins, which is a great song, was uh, written before 911. But then people interpreted it in that way, and it's one of those songs that took on a new meaning. Uh, and then the title track, The Rising, very hopeful, very powerful, a real love letter to New York. So. Uh, this is probably the last Bruce Springsteen album that I truly loved. Uh, I've tried to remain a fan of his. Um, I don't think he's, um, when I do my, I've done, I have a series on here called the Legacy Series where I take artists that are still um, cutting edge in the 21st century and I will not do one on Bruce Springsteen. I don't think that he's really reinventing much for the 21st century. but. Hey, he's still Bruce, you know, and even average Bruce is still pretty damn good Bruce. So that's it, numbers 30 through 16. Tell me what you think. Tell me what some of your favorite albums are. Uh, part two will be coming next. I'll do 15 through one, and then I'll do a Spotify playlist with just highlights from the albums. Um, even when I do the highlights, it's still like a 10 to 12 hour playlist. So. I try to keep it short, but you know, when you take four songs from every album, uh, that's uh, 120 songs, so it's still a long playlist, but for those of you who want to deep, do a deep dive, you can either play the playlist or you can click on the particular album and listen to the whole thing, so I'll put that up for you. I've had enough people ask me to do that. And so that's it. If you like what we're doing here on the channel, hit the like or subscribe button. Thank you for letting me record outdoors. And as we say here in Mexico, buen dia.